Hello viewers, welcome to AP's Ophthalmology Pearls. Today we shall discuss the pupillary light reflex pathway. When light strikes the eye, the rods and cones undergo phototransduction and the signal thus generated is processed by the bipolar cells that are synapse on the retinal ganglion cells. There are different types of retinal ganglion cells, those that are involved in the pupillary light reflex to almost exclusively the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells that contain melanopsin as a photopigment. In addition to receiving input from the rods and cones, they also undergo phototransduction upon being exposed to light even without photoreceptor input. These retinal ganglion cells are densest in the central retina where they have more of a one-to-one -one relationship with the photoreceptors and bipolar cells compared to that in the periphery. These ganglion cells constitute not more than 1% of the total number of ganglion cells. The axons of these ganglion cells then travel in the nerve fibrillary of the retina to enter the optic nerve. Before tracing the afferent pathway, a very brief orientation to the midbrain to help in greater understanding. This is the pons, this is the fourth ventricle, this is the cerebral aqueduct. This is the superior colliculus, which along with the inferior colliculus is referred to as the tectum of the midbrain. Just rostral to the superior colliculus is the posterior commissure, which is a system of white fibers that is situated dorsal to the sylvian aqueduct in the most cranial portion of the midbrain. We should see the cross section of the midbrain at the level of the posterior commissure. This is the superior colliculus. The pretectal nucleus is called so because it is situated ventral to the superior colliculus which is the tectum. The posterior commissure lies dorsal to the sylvian aqueduct. This is the lateral geniculate body. This is the brachium of the superior colliculus that is a connecting arm between the superior colliculus and lateral geniculate body. The axons of the retinal ganglion cells enter the optic nerve and reach the chiasm. Here, crossing of nasal retinal fibers occurs similar to that of visual fibers and then the axons enter the optic tract. So each optic tract contains axons from the ipsilateral half of the retina on each side and therefore of the contralateral half of the visual field in both eyes. However, unlike that of the visual fibers, fibers of the afferent pupillary pathway leave the optic tract just before the lateral geniculate body and travel through the brachium of the superior colliculus to reach and relay in the ipsilateral pretectal olivary nucleus. Each pretectal nucleus sends axons to both edinger westphal nuclei where the efferent pathway for the pupillary right, light reflex begins. Preganglionic parasympathetic fibers originate in the edinger westphal nuclei and then travel in the ipsilateral oculomotor nerve and continue in its inferior branch to travel in the nerve to inferior oblique. From here, the fibers travel in an offshoot of the nerve to inferior oblique to enter and synapse in the ipsilateral caesary ganglion. The postganglionic fibers from the caesary ganglion travel via the short caesary nerves that pierce the globe adjacent to the optic nerve, travel in the supracorridor space before supplying the iris to produce pupillary constriction. The postganglionic fibers from the caesary ganglion are the only parasympathetic postganglionic fibers in the body to be myelinated, possibly because of a need for a rapid response. It is interesting that the fibers to the sphincter constitute only 3 to 5 percent of these fibers. All the others supply the caesary muscle. Coming to the applied anatomy. The consensual response is due to double decussation in the pupillary light reflex pathway, one at the level of the chiasm and the other at the level of the pretectal region of the midbrain. Some excitatory pathways from the occipital area to the oculomotor complex and which facilitate pupillary constriction for near stimuli are situated more ventrolaterally than the light reflex pathways and hence lesions of the pretectal and edinger westphal nuclei or the decussetting fibers of the pretectal nucleus in the posterior commissure do not affect these pathways. This is responsible for the light near dissociation where the pupil is relatively unresponsive to light but constricts normally to accommodation. This is seen classically in Tabes dorsalis and in Parinod's dorsal midbrain syndrome among others. Pupillomotor fibers are situated superficially in the superomedial portion of the oculomotor nerve in the subarachnoid space. 
and hence are susceptible to the effects of compressive lesions most commonly posterior communicating artery aneurysms which affect the pyel blood supply to the fibers as well as produce direct compression the nasal crossing is asymmetric with each optic tract receiving approximately 53% of input from the contralateral eye hence the temporal field is larger this asymmetry of pupillary pupillary motor input extends from the optic tract to the pretectal nucleus and hence a lesion anywhere along this pathway produces a contralateral rapd an rapd without visual dysfunction localizes the lesion to the contralateral brachium of the superior colliculus or pretectal olivary nucleus Since the pupillary fibers leave the optic tract before the lateral geniculate body, lesions of the geniculate bodies, optic radiations or visual cortex do not affect the pupillary reactivity. Because optic tract lesions produce hemianopia, if a point source of light is shone on the affected retina, pupillary reaction will be absent as opposed to the presence of a pupillary reaction when the light is shone on the unaffected half of the retina. Since the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells can stimulate a pupillary response without photoreceptor input, this may help explain why some patients with extensive photoreceptor damage may still exhibit an intact pupillary light reflex. This could also explain why such patients still maintain a circadian cycle as it is these ganglion cells that are involved in synchronization of circadian rhythm to the pattern of light and dark in the environment through their projections to the suprachiasmatic nucleus. It may also explain other clinical examples that support the concept of separate ganglion cells for visual perception and pupillary light reflex. These include cases of complete non-cerebral monocular or binocular blindness in which the pupillary reaction to light persists cases of recovered optic neuritis in which visual function uh, has returned to normal but light reflex has not and instances in which pupillary motor activity returns to normal before visual function in cases of amaurosis also these retinal ganglion cells are more concentrated in the central retina thus is a greater amplitude of pupillary response to stimuli in the central visual field so that's it for today if you like what you saw subscribe to my channel and hit the bell icon to never miss an update from ap's of the moji pearls you may watch my other videos by clicking on the thumbnails please leave a note in the comment section if you wish for any particular topic to be covered in future look forward to weekly updates thank you for watching